Okay, welcome everyone to AMLA After Hours. Thank you for joining us this evening. Um, uh, we are going to, you know, start uh, this program off. Uh, the topic for this one is landscape reimagined. Um, so we will be tackling the subject of landscape. Um, but we will begin with uh, traditional concepts and understandings and then move on to alternative views and approaches of landscapes as seen in Western American art. Uh, the goal of this presentation uh, is to complicate or make one think about both the definition of a landscape painting as well as our personal relationships with or views of landscapes that surround us. Uh, traditionally, landscape painting is the depiction of a natural um, scene or natural scenery in art, according to Britannica. Um, it may include natural features such as mountains, valleys, bodies of water, prairies, forests, and coastlines, and may or may not include man-made structures as well as human subjects. Um, landscape as a term used in reference to art is fairly modern, however. Until the 17th century, natural scenery was relegated to the backgrounds of history or religious scenes. I'm sorry, let me make sure. Yeah. Uh, so until the 17th century, natural scenery was relegated to the backgrounds of history or religious scenes. It was in the 17th century that the French Academy uh, classified uh, the genre of art placing landscape painting fourth out of five genres in order of importance. As centuries, decades, and years have passed, landscape painting proved to be increasingly popular through romanticized and naturalistic depictions of the natural world. Landscape painting was particularly popular in the United States in promoting manifest destiny and westward expansion, placing emphasis on the natural beauty of the American landscape. So with that, um, the first self-consciously American painters were landscape artists. The Hudson River School is uh, the name used to identify New York-based landscape painters that emerged around 1850. These artists produced large-scale paintings and aimed to capture uh, the grander and sublime nature of the natural world. Artists such as Thomas Hill, Thomas Moran, Albert Bierstad, Asher B. Durand, John F. Kensett, and Worthington Whitridge, among others, were part of this school of artists, um, with the father or founder being Thomas Cole. Thomas Cole wrote, quote, nature is still predominant, and there are those who regret that with the improvements of cultivation, the sublimity of the wilderness should pass away, for those scenes of solitude from which the hands of nature has never been lifted affect the mind with a more deep-toned emotion than aught which the hand of man has touched." End quote. In the observation that Cole and other artists made of the quickly passing beauty of the American landscape, there is the production of the romanticized landscapes, untouched by what he deemed the ravage of the axe, or utilizing symbolism to warn against the loss of natural beauty. These works serve an early, as early documents for the need or move towards preserving landscape, as well as a memory of the landscape before the hand of civilization touched it. Yet also, these works support and further the cause of manifest destiny due to the use of the images to promote westward expansion. In Thomas Cole's A Wild Scene, which you can see here, the foreground warns against the decay of, a, of nature with an impending dark storm encroaching on the men touching the landscape and kind of quite literally um, 
you know, taking axes and bows and arrows to the natural scene. Uh, the source of the storm um, stems from the romanticized and sublime waterfall in the background of the image, and it alludes to the forthcoming doom that nature is to set upon man for its destruction. Uh, this work speaks to the warning of man's impact on the landscape, while also romanticizing it through one of the many elements which Cole identifies as essential to the American wilderness, um, the, the center or almost center of this image, which is the waterfall. Um, and so Cole identified that as, as an essential part of the American wilderness. Some Hudson River School artists found the Rocky Mountain landscape as a prime subject for American landscape painting um, instead. Continuing to produce grand canvases depicting natural beauty, these artists uh, that traveled west were more realistic in their depictions of nature and landscapes. Uh, following the teaching of Asher B. Durand, specifically in his Letters on Landscape Painting from 1855, which promoted naturalism as the new standard in American landscape painting. And this piece is um, in the museum collection um, and on view here, um, made by Asher B. Durand. Uh, one of these artists that did end up traveling west was Worthington Whitridge, uh, an Ohio-born artist. Whitridge holds a specific or a special place in the art history of Colorado landscape, as many of his paintings depict sites that are readily identifiable. Despite the changes that have taken place since Western travels in the 1860s and 1870s. He studied painting from a very early age, and after experimenting with portrait painting and early photographic techniques, Whitridge found artistic success in landscape painting. Whitridge spent a decade overseas living in Germany and Italy, and upon his return to the United States, Whitridge set up his studio in New York alongside artists like Albert Bierstadt and Asher B. Durant. At first, he struggled to adapt his European training to the American landscape, but after honing his adapt, uh, adoption um, on New England sketching expeditions, uh, he rose to prominence in the New York art scene and became a full member of the National Academy of Design in 1861. Whitridge took three trips to the American West between 1865 and 1871. The first trip led by General Pope traveled through Colorado where they followed the South Platte to Denver, then to Fort Morgan and up to Fort Collins. Finally crossing the Rockies at the Spanish Peaks on their way to the Department of the Missouri near Santa Fe, New Mexico. Uh, the vistas that he encountered on this trip inspired his work as he had never seen landscapes like this before. He captured the essence of the country where the plains meet in the mountains and the soft atmospheric effects of his paintings create a sense of tranquility within these landscapes. Encampment on the Platte River was one of the first large scale paintings that Whitridge uh, produced after returning from his first expedition out west. Uh, the composition here and landscape of this painting is most likely drawn from the sketches that he produced throughout his travels out west. What we see in this painting are Ute uh, Indians making their way across the river on horseback toward the dwelling, uh, Whitridge writes, quote, I had never seen the plains or anything like them. They impressed me deeply. I cared more for them than the mountains and very few of my Western pictures have been produced from sketches made actually in the mountains, but rather from those made on the plains with the mountains at a distance, end quote. 
At the turn of the century, the definition of landscape was challenged. The challenge to the traditional view of landscape paintings was partially due to industrialization and urbanization as more man-made structures entered into landscape painting. However, the urbanization and modernization came also modern art, which introduced less traditional mediums as well as new approaches towards landscape. Uh, though this talk will not focus on this point, modern artists started producing land artwork found within the landscape or that um, utilizes natural materials as its medium itself. Most pertinent to landscape painting was, tra was um, transitions towards modernism. Modern art is art that is open to interpretation, and this is based within how we, um, as a viewer, uh, see the artwork. And so that is, you know, our personal interpretation of the piece. In this Spain, there are two ways that we can view this um, early abstracted landscape by Ward Lockwood, that's um, in AMLA's collection. Uh, first, there is the view of an aerial, um, there's this painting takes on an aerial view of horses between two mountain formations. Um, the second way that we could kind of break down this image is as horses distorted in the foreground of the image. Um, so here, uh, horses in the midground of the image, uh, which is here in the middle of the image, um, and mountains within the background uh, right here. Lockwood would experiment um, with the properties of paint. He adopted a rough appearance upon um, a very rough textural appearance upon his arrival in New Mexico. Um, and so this roughness we can also see uh, within kind of his exploration of paints and paint textures uh, as he was, um, you know, taking on the subject of landscape um, within the New Mexico area. This piece demonstrates a deliberate textural and formal crudeness with the blotchy surface suggesting the shaggy winter coats of horses within the snow. Um, Lockwood has heavily outlined the horses and the mountains so uniformly as to destroy familiar figure grounded relationships and to make this an all over composition, which was very essential within the practice of um, modern art and specifically applying you know, European modern art traditions and practices. He repeats the outline of the horses at the bottom of the picture, but so roughly that it is impossible to tell whether they are horses or merely semi-abstract echoes of other shapes um, within the composition. I would like to encourage you to think about how you are approaching this landscape and how you are viewing it, whether it's in that aerial um, kind of point of view or in more of a traditional landscape with a foreground, midground, and background. Uh, when it comes to modern depictions of landscapes, the viewer's perspective on the piece um, and take on the scene is a significant part of the understanding of the work. And so that's kind of why I kind of encourage you to, to take your own um, time to, to understand how you are viewing the layout of this piece. We as viewers break down and interpret the image in different ways, um, which is very much the artist's intention. As mentioned before, modern art is art that is open to interpretation and that is rooted in how we as the viewers see the artwork. Uh, modern art is made up of different styles and movements. And so I'm gonna kind of go through a few of them. Um, beginning with abstraction, and I've provided works within AMWA's collection to kind of give you a point of reference, visual reference for um, works that fit within that, within that style. So beginning with abstraction, abstract art is art that does not attempt to represent an accurate depiction of a visual reality, 
but instead uses shapes, colors, form, and gestural marks to achieve its effects. Um, and then so next we have cubism. And cubism was a revolutionary approach that brought different views of subjects, usually objects or figures, together in the same picture, resulting in paintings that appear fragmented and also abstracted. Um, we then have uh, Expressionism, and Expressionists um, actually revolted against Impressionism. Their goal was to, 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 to depict the world as it felt rather than how it looked. This was done through extreme angles, flattened forms, garish colors, and distorted views. As seen in these paintings, all of these modern styles and movements were and continue to be applied to landscapes, um, presenting an alternative view to our traditional understanding of landscape going beyond realism um, and naturalism. So, so providing an alternative um, kind of mode of creation to those earlier landscape artists um, really rooted within realism and naturalism. So going back to the Lockwood piece here, Lockwood states, quote, art has been and will be an organic, unified, and meaningful expression of what the artist feels, sees, and knows, end quote. Modern landscapes intend to merge forces beyond the frame, feelings, sensations, experiences, with that of the physical space that the artist might be taking in. As we look at landscape with horses, what do we feel? Or do we have a sense of what the artist is expressing here? Is Lockwood presenting an aerial view of horses between two mountain formations, which could imply feelings of being stuck or isolated? Or is it a scene of horses distorted in the foreground, horses in the midground, and mountains in the background, reflecting perspectives of expansive space, vastness, or even a feeling of being part of the herd? Throughout the body of Lockwood's work, he explored the abstract possibilities that were possible within landscape painting. As we move beyond general definitions of landscape reliant on views of the natural world, one can explore the term in reference to space, including that of interior space, i.e. interior landscapes or the built environment. George Caleb Bingham's paintings reflect his youth. For example, these figures seem to be redefined groups of pioneers. His paintings during 1845 to 1855 generally relate to life along the Mississippi and Missouri rivers. His home state of Missouri was the embarkation point for many Western migrations. In much of Bingham's work, we see an exploration of the built environment or an interior landscape, dimly lit with small realistic light sources. Bingham employs luminism, an American landscape style from the 1850s to the 1870s. Quote, luminism was an artist's attempt at capturing the mysteries of nature through the detailed depictions of natural light, end quote. Bingham uses natural light sources from the candle and the lantern, as well as the fire to reveal his scenes of family life or the interior landscape. In particular, the interior landscapes that are on view at Amwa depict pioneer families on frontier living. Ranch houses in the West range from humble dirt floor lean-tos to lavish mansions. And on small scale ranches on the plains, an entire family might live in a tiny sod hut. If a ranch had forest lands, the rancher likely built a log cabin. 
and a single fireplace provided winter warmth and a wood burning stove occupied much of the kitchen. Ranchers would expand and improve the dwellings if they made enough profits um, and larger ranches would have outbuildings, including a barn, outhouse, cookhouse, and bunkhouses for cowboys. For many individuals and families on the frontier, reading was a great escape from their work day, lives. Almost everyone who had the ability to read um, whatever they, they, they read, whatever they could get their hands on at this time, um, whether that be um, the Bible to classic works of literature to months old newspapers or magazines. In breaking down the built environment of the West, we can look at the progression of, um, you know, the concept of home or structures of the West. At this time, rest, um, as time progressed, advances were made in pioneers building, in addition to the ideas and concepts um, that were taking place within interior spaces. There began to be a sense of taming the wilderness or a need to separate the wilderness. An example of this um, would be um, solid walls um, and the want and the, and the need or, or seen need for solid walls. In Anglo-Western perspective, pioneers used the land and the resources to build homes, honing the landscape, repurposing the landscape for their own needs. Uh, the forest was the settler's enemy. It had to be destroyed to create their fields. Um, this was very much the perspective at the time. Um, this perspective is connected to concepts such as um, Thomas Cole's concept of ravages of the axe, um, explored by Hudson River School artists, uh, particularly Thomas Cole and some of his writings. At the time of westward expansion and settlement, there was urgency in clearing land for settler habitation and cultivation. Some artists chose to memorialize the land um, and natural resources, while others positioned it as a settler's friend. It gave them logs for their cabin, fuel for their fire, rails for their fences, wheels for their wagons, and a frame for their plow. Um, logs, uh, logs split into flat-faced planks called puncheons were used to make um, cabin floors, which we can see in this detail um, of, of the George Calum Bingham um, painting that is on view at AMLA. A door was sawed out of, um, was sawed out. Typically the first doorway covering was an old quilt weighted with a log and later a bo board door would be hung on leather hinges um, to replace that quilt covering. Opposite the cabin doorway was the chimney mouth typically. Uh, clay from the creek bank mixed with dried grass was formed into clumsy bricks which hardened in the sun and they were um, laid against the cabin wall. The bricks formed a cat and clay chimney with a broad opening. Uh, the fire that smoldered there gave heat for cooking, light, and warmth, which is why it serves as a focal point within um, Bingham's composition here. Outside, the axe um, would have thudded and the smoke of the brush fires would have hazed the air. Uh, slowly, the field was widened and a few new acres were cultivated every year. The cabin in the clearing was the pioneer's homestead. Uh, when it gave way to a frame house with a traveled road going past, the pioneer life um, had ended. Pioneer families tended to be quite large. Uh, most cabins had a cradle, which we see here in this piece, uh, hollowed from a poplar or cottonwood log and the cradle was rarely empty due to um, the amount of children that pioneers were having at the time. 
children were very helpful in New Land. Um, girls soon learned important household tasks and boys would go to work um, in the fields. Interior landscapes are also explored through still life paintings. Uh, as this still life of Joseph Bagos displays a natural scene of interior space um, and its use. Uh, a kitchen table left strewn with items such as a coffee cup, reading material, apple, bottle, and glass, and a loaf of bread reflect a realistic moment that might even reflect a recognizable or familiar interior landscape to some of us. Uh, can we relate to this scene or this depiction that we're being shown? Um, the captured moment is even further connected to the concept of landscape through the presence of the window at the upper center of the campus. Through the window, a landscape is quite literally shown, um, both drawing our eye out the window, but also connecting the built environment to the natural landscape that it fits within. Uh, thus producing a fuller concept of a settled or modernized landscape um, compared to some of the other interior landscapes that we have looked at today. The final concept that I would like to introduce and explore is the idea of a ritual landscape and a ritual landscape scenes within art. Um, dances and ceremonies are central to indigenous cultures and communities within North America. Uh, paralleling this ceremony um, commonly takes place at the center of Pueblos, community space, um, and also or sometimes identified as the plazas. Uh, Howard Cook was a printmaker by practice. Uh, though he also produced paintings of various mediums. Later in his career, he painted oils of indigenous dancers and landscapes that are filled with texture and abstract decoration. In Koshari San Domingo Corn Dance, Cook's focus was more involved with rhythm than, than pictorial accuracy. Uh, focus on the lines and forms of his composition uh, was focus was on the lines and the forms of his composition here. It leans towards a design aesthetic and emphasizes the mass amount of movement that is taking place at a wide angle view of the landscape. The landscape of the piece is eliminated actually altogether. The abstracted dancers swirl in a void that focuses on rhythm and color rather than setting or landscape. Cook said, quote, I've always wanted the suggestion of movement in my work, end quote. He had traveled all over the world producing artwork in North Africa and then in the Middle East. Um, and you can see some influences from his travels in this piece specifically within the faces that are referencing African masks rather than Native American masks. According to scholars, quote, every August 4th at Santo Domingo, an adobe village with a smaller population than many urban housing projects, uh, the Native American dance, um, the Native Americans dance the summer corn dance, end quote. If they did not dance, they say, the tribe would disintegrate, the sky would not rain, the earth would not grow crops, children would not be born, and the seasons and stars would not turn. The dance is for the pueblo and for its patron saint, Saint Dominic. Uh, the summer corn dance is the most important of the cycle of dances that make up the ritual year in Santo Domingo. They mark every important aspect of Pueblo life, birth, procreation, death, farming, hunting, the earth, and everything that lives on it. The past, present, and future um, of the tribe. Many of the dances have been incorporated into the tribe's Catholic ceremonial calendar as well. The Pueblo has adopted Catholic traditions as well 
as foreign dancers since the Spanish came into the area in the 17th century. Much of the Pueblo's religious life is sacred and secret, so not much is known about clothing or the exact reasons for ceremony, rituals, and dances. Um, Anglo-Westerners only see the basic understandings of the celebration as promoting growth and fertility. The order of dance is not known and, active, uh, and activity taking place in the kivas are also um, quite secret. Based upon descriptions and witnesses of the dance, the figures shown in Cook's piece are the kosharis or priest clowns. They wear corn tufts on their head and are bone white. In this piece, um, with the different influences, Cook is creating his own view and his own interpretation of this ritual landscape. Ritual and religion is very personal. However, scenes or views into a religion to reveal um, or views can um, kind of lean into a religion to reveal a ritual landscape. Uh, this connects the ceremonial practice in plazas or the layout of a church or altars. Um, and it centers on human interaction within the space and surrounding people or community. Structures stand within the landscape and connect to the land location and people integrating into a larger concept of landscape. Whether it is rooted in religion or not, I ask you to think about what your ritual landscapes are. Um, you know, and here are two very different depictions of paintings that could very much be seen um, as a ritual landscape or a depiction of landscape uh, as well. Uh, so overall, kind of with, with those three main kind of themes of landscape and reimagining landscapes, I hope that we have all expanded our understanding of what qualifies as a landscape and even a landscape painting, um, repositioning the term landscape into a view or scene that connects land, people, or community. Uh, a landscape can be, can be personal or overarching, as we have compl complicated and explored both our definitions of a landscape painting, as well as our personal relationships with landscapes that surround us, um, or we are a part of, I encourage you to continue to pose these thoughts when looking at art moving forward, um, possibly, you know, looking at other art that might not traditionally strike you as a landscape and, and try and see, you know, if, if you can explore it within the language of landscapes or within the context 